welcome to episode three of the Tri Unity series with Dr. Shamil Asher. He's going to be with us in just a second, and we're going to kind of pick up some pieces today from the previous show, uh, episode two. We have a couple of topics we want to fill in and apprise. Again, we remind you that the material in this in these in these series is largely coming from the book The Soul Revolution. And uh, that book is available in the links that are provided with the shows on the website and on YouTube. Um, we will never be able to condense all that information into a single audio format ever. So it's important that as you go and grow with us here, um, you avail yourself of the written material because it's dense and it does require a fair amount of attention. With that, I want to welcome again our presenter, Dr. Shamil Asher. Welcome. Thanks, Randy. It's good to have you back. Um, episode three, um, <clears throat> we're going to kind of do a couple of segues here off of off of episode two because we actually were two different flows of topical matter, both of which ultimately do connect. And maybe what we can do today is kind of connect some of the lines and all of that. Uh, the first part of that show in episode two. Uh, once we got past some of the definitions that we were working on, um, was largely to do with um, artificial intelligence, the archons, and uh, the things that played into um, the reformatted uh, space that we live in and its effects on consciousness. And then, um, secondly, today we're going to also kind of pick up the again the topic of the flat creation space what's commonly called flat earth and kind of take that into a slightly different direction because we're going to go into um, aspects of Genesis chapter 11 which talk about the Tower of Babel which then relates to CERN as well so just to kind of pick up on the first side of this Shamil we did not get a chance to talk about the web bot in relationship to artificial intelligence the last time. So let's kind of um, go into that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think towards the end of uh, the end of the second show, we we sounded like uh, we we're rolling along there like two tweakers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> jump, jump, jump. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess I guess you know to, to intro it back into where we were, you know, so people can kind of catch up if they forgot what we said in the first show you know the the whole idea here is that um, that by our own consent you know we uh, we have virtually enslaved uh, or they have virtually enslaved many portions of the, uh, the eternal creator's very own microcosm souls uh, from his from his macro souls so the, the micro souls apportioned from his own essence you know therefore you know our these are entities that are working very diligently to uh, to keep us enslaved. Mm -hmm. uh, the rebellion leaders uh, uh, having uh, they don't have the the innate ability to return to the original creation, our original creator, our original condition. They don't have that ability anymore. I don't believe uh, so. Uh, they can what. Like we like we were just talking, I think on the first show mostly was uh, we said that I, I was we were talking about how they they can't uh, return and, and and they were cut off. So their soul energy, our soul energy, is literally a life sustaining force, uh, you know, for them. So this is this is kind of the crux of, of the of the entire idea. And and then uh, and then on top of that, the way they're doing it is through the false narratives, like we were talking. So we want to you know kind of update people on that that. Uh, this is all concerning uh, uh, <clears throat> a plethora of false narratives that they have uh, originally designed and continue updating. And 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 what we're finding now, I believe, um, maybe not through the web bot. I think the web bot program. <coughs> I think that program, uh, that algorithm, and that that whole idea, um, and the way it the way it works. I, I think that proves. Uh, pretty much the science and what I've also written in this book that uh, soul revolution that that these that that our souls are creative entities and that because they're creative entities their emotional uh, output their uh, our uh, what we assimilate and then we'll 
and then what we project outward can be tracked. Uh, and in that tracking, which we we're seeing through that uh, WebBot program, is kind of the proof of that. You're talking, I, I, you're talking here about Cliff High at HalfPastHuman.com's WebBot program, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, and in, and in with that, though, uh, we have, uh, even before that, we have the Torah code. Now, that, that Torah code, which um, between religious people and, and, and many others who are not so religious, but they, they, they are latching on to that, and uh, they have a great willingness to believe and follow yet another false control narrative through that uh, Torah code. Um, you know, and I say that because, you, you know, we, you're taking a good look at it, and I, I can just, you know, just for people that don't know, the Torah code uh, is, you know, divine, uh, is the definition of it, I guess, would be a, a form of, it's a, a, the form of, of gematria, all right, numerology, that utilizes selected equidistant Equidistance letter spacing, yeah. Uh, you know, proclaiming to be hidden prophecies of end times, of the end times and of different things. And uh, many religious people claim, you know, this to be a little miracle from God. Again, you know, I always ask, which God? I always tell people, ask, which God? And, uh, you know, in my opinion, it ranks right up there with uh, other false narratives. But this one's just, I, I, I found over time as I looked at it, and uh, that it was pretty amazing to me because it. It wasn't prophecy, but it was starting years ago, starting to be treated as pro prophecy. It's, it's actually after the fact, if you if you look at it. Um, it's, 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 they're finding these things after the event um, in the Torah Code. And that, to me, uh, you know, when you, when you look at it like... Uh, They're, it, they have to be updating the holiverse. And I think just as the, the WebBot program viably shows, <coughs> or proves, excuse me, that our souls, uh, the projection of our emotional condition uh, which we assimilate through the false narratives and narratives of life, whether they're false or not, are, are given to us, assimilated, and then uh, projected outwards in a creational manner. So just like the WebBot program can track that, which in my mind proves that, uh, we have the Torah Code, which people are finding all of these... Uh, Names and dates and uh, phrases and things after the after the fact after the event, uh, and to me that's proving that someone else out there in control of this hollow verse at the moment, those who I call the disobedient souls, the ones that other people call fallen whatever archons, are manipulating the reality and therefore updating the way that your your Microsoft computer uh, refreshes its operating system. Uh, it, 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 peri it periodically up, you know, gets updates from its computer god. Right. Right. right? Microsoft. So it's getting updates. So so is this getting updates? Um, the code the Torah code's getting updates, and I and I say that, you know, people say, "Oh well, no, no, it's been there for thousands of years. We just didn't know it." Well, I have a problem with that because when you start showing me words like twin towers, like uh, you know, specific stuff, to, you know, John F. Kennedy, uh, uh, even more specific stuff, uh, you know, airplane, okay, uh, helicopter, whatever very specific stuff that didn't exist back then that the Hebrew doesn't even have a word for back then. Now you're telling me the word exists, the phrase exists, the names exist that didn't exist when this was allegedly 
written, scribed. Are you familiar at all with this web phenomenon? And you'll be forgiven if you're not. Uh, I wish I didn't. Called the Mandela effect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of this feels to me like the same phenomena that people are calling the Mandela effect, which is kind of this pop culture um, reflection of misremembering or altered facts, or in some cases, things that. I think went into the popular culture in a certain way and and you know everything in the popular culture gets spun through this machine whether it's like 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 media like television or film or music uh the internet's now a gigantic gigantic meme generator so it sounds like very similar to what you're talking about. And I don't want to pull you into that jackpot because it's just not even worth going after. Right, right. And that's, <clears throat> yeah, and that's pretty much it. I mean, consider, like, um, I, 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 there's a section of the book, uh, page or two, like, uh, subtitled Parlor Trick, where, you know, I, I'm telling people to look at this and, and consider such things to to. to let them understand how how that false narrative, the driving of false narratives and the uh, consumption and assimilation of those false narratives, fear narratives mostly, generally fear narratives, if you, if you really think about it, uh, fear-based narratives, and, and then <clears throat> everyone consumes them. Uh, they become emotionally uh, disrupted by it, uh, and it's, it's in there whether they're thinking about it all the time or not. And it's causing, <clears throat> whether they know it or not, their soul to to go ahead and and uh, project, and they're projecting uh, those those things that were assimilated. So I tell people to consider, like uh, you know, the time around whatever it was, uh, 2012. You know, the, uh, uh, the approaching total collapse and world destruction of the year 2012, and, right? And everything that went with that, the Mayan Code, I mean, every little uh, tributary that and, and, and stream, everything that came off of that, you know, and then you had the high Torah Code experts in Jerusalem and New York, they were finding that all those use of those modern words, you know, the to the to in the Hebrew text relating to all things 2012, you know, would... Uh, and much the same way they found mo modern words, like like I said, airplane bombs in New York City, you know, after September 11th, they did that. They found that, right? So it's after the fact. It's not prophecy. And, uh, you know, but any person with a Hebrew linguistic background, I mean, they they should know these. You, you'd be, you know, where are you getting these per these phonetic Hebrew words uh, depicting objects, locations, proper names, personal and professional attributes? And they didn't exist back then in in the language or at any time you know, until a modern day. So the fact is, it just cannot be. So uh, it can't be unless this level, this creation level, this, this reality is exactly as our scientists and, and our ancient prophets tell us it is. Uh, basically a, pl a plasma, matter-based holographic construct. So when, when you look at this stuff, um, it, it's obviously, it's, it's not prophecy, but it's, it's always being driven like it's prophecy. And I, again, I look at the nuances. I want to know why. Why are they driving it like this? Why are they allowing people to believe it's some kind of godly prophetic message that's being uh, put there or, or that was put there X amount of years ago uh, by the hand of scribes, blah, 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 when, when it, it just couldn't be because the words didn't exist, so it couldn't be. And, uh, you know, but, again, you have, these are all compelling fear narratives, you know, that, 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 that's being driven. What's, you know, follow the money. What, what's, what's happening here? With, it's fear narratives that are being driven more and more and more. But now you have fear narratives being driven or not so much. You have the fear narratives being driven on the front side, right? And then an event happens. Then what happens is you have the fear narrative then being bolstered by the high priests of parlor tricks, uh, and 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 they're bolstering this by saying, well, look, I mean, look, it was foretold ten thousand years ago, blah blah blah, blah whatever, uh, you know. And and <laughs> and then the problem is people just hear that, and and because that person, that rabbi, whoever it is, has the air of authority, uh, you're automatic believing it. So, uh, it just like uh, what during Y two K, you know, you had the. 
specific fear narrative topics, you know, as they loom larger, right? Uh, Y2K, whatever it is, the Mayan 2012 event, the 2015 Tetrad Blood Moon events, uh, you know, the collective agitation grows before. On the, on the front, they're front-loading this stuff. So on the front side, your collective agitation grows in, in the souls of the people. And they don't know it's their souls that, that, that this is happening. Your brain is just, is, is just hardware, and, and your brain is, is bringing the stuff in and allowing it to be assimilated. You think it's your brain, your emotions, you don't even know what that means, your emotions, are, are assimilating and utilizing this stuff. But it's not that. It's your soul that's being polluted by it technically. And, and uh, it's contributing uh, to how that soul then uh, initiates and projects what it's feeling and, and what it's afraid of, it's, it's that fear. So you have your collective agitation growing on the front side, internally and externally, uh, all of which uploads and, and feeds that, their energy wraith system, right, of course, because that's, that's the byproduct, uh, which then in turn uh, sends out the real-time updates, right? So their system then, after they're being fed by us, turns around and sends out more real-time updates, into the system like your laptop gets from Microsoft God, uh, which then, of course, uh, miraculously is found after the fact in the Torah code, uh, which is used as proof to complete and renew the cycle. So clearly the Torah code becomes the control narrative all on its own, uh, and, 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 and really a very dangerous one and a very powerful one. And I have a theory about what it's going to be used for later. Uh, you know, so should you buy into the concept uh, – that this is actually prophetic, uh, then you've just given over your approval and your consent to yet another level of authority over you. So, uh, you know, this results on everybody sitting on pins and needles waiting for the next word, you know, <laughs> words or phrases uh, to be turned out of, the, uh, out, of the, out of the Torah code to instill, you know, which will instill more mass soul consciousness fear. You know, so and and that, and that just basically turns the whole thing around again, and uh, and, and it just it just continues from there. Uh, it's, it's like a, a destructive Trojan computer virus. Uh, that's uh, you know, it becomes captivated and and controlled by by an inf like an infectious virus program. So our collective soul consciousness is drawn in, and then the power of suggestion. You know, into believing the events, et cetera, et cetera. You know, as predicted by the ancients. You know, given to us by the uh, by the priests. You know, it must be true. Well, isn't this really even the same template that we see um, with the biblical prophecy people out there? And look, I did this for years. I mean, I'm very familiar with the system and how it works. Um, the taking of the Book of Revelation and harmonizing it, as they like to call it. Harmonizing the Gospels. That's a, that's a good one. Um, harmonizing it with um, the book of Daniel, for instance. And then aggregating all of these different data points contained in these two books, n n none of which has any historical concurrency. And then just spinning off these prophecies that more and more are beginning to look very valid as we go into this technocratic era. And, and people don't realize where, you know, you ask some a Christian, oh, well, where did that prophecy, you know, concerning Revelation and coupled with Daniel and this and that, uh, well, you know, where, where, where did that originate from? Who originated that? Nobody knows. And the problem is nobody knows. <laughs> so, so for all you know, and most likely it is, is yet another fear narrative. They're all intermingled and and collected you know so whatever daniel said uh most of which i believe was true um and for specific reasons which are in my first book land of meat and honey which will tell you why uh, the, the prophet daniel is worth listening to uh but like you're saying they're putting them together and and uh, you know turning into a, a hollywood movie and you know <laughs> which they literally do you know, so th then you have all this stuff. Uh, yeah, the Left Behind series, that the, the rapture oh, and all of that. Yeah, I, I, millions, of, millions and millions, multi millions of dollars made off just the books alone. Yep. These, these guys, and they don't have half a clue of what they're even talking about when it comes to anything 
in any of those books, not even their own, I don't believe. Oh, no, that was, that was like a comic book. I mean, I debunked that back in the day when it was coming out. Having said that, I've had to debunk myself and deconstruct my own work from that period because I saw myself doing it. I saw myself putting... Where I didn't have a puzzle piece, I carved one out. I mean, you know, you have to be honest about where you are yourself in these things and, and I reached the point where I went I, I can't do this anymore you know I've been told this book is perfect it's the inspired word of God is perfectly translated and preserved God can preserve his word and I'm looking at it and I'm going mm, no not so much anymore what I know about the translators what I know about transmission of scriptures what uh, what happened with you know the, the the original Latin translators and then going into the, um, the 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 English translators of the King James Bible, there is just right. no way that you could maintain a, a critical center with that any longer. No, I mean in my first book, Land of Me Nani, I go through the, I, I utilize the documentary hypothesis to show people in the most simplest way and give them all this other information about diacritic change of, of languages and stuff that. You know, once they get through it, it's a little long in that chapter, but once they get through it, if they haven't committed suicide before that, you know, they, they, they're, you know, they're, they're looking at, you know, they don't know what to do with themselves anymore because once you go look at that, you see how many versions of translations and who did it and why the Pope, the papacy changed it from this to that or what, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And, and I, and, and my, and it was highly redacted. There's a lot more you can find out once I gave them enough in that book to, to set them on a course so they can, you know, start looking on their own. But, uh, yeah, well, they, they, they move this stuff, you know, fictionally like crazy. I mean, that, that's, if you look at Hollywood, it's been totally taken over. It's, uh, you see all this stuff, all these false fear narratives and whatnot played out on movie screens and in the books, and and then a similar incident appears in the alleged, you know, news. <laughs> when I say alleged because it's not actually news anymore, and then uh, and then we begin to actually believe and more dangerously assimilate emotionally uh, what we're what we're seeing because it's uh, it's been backed up by movies and books and and different things which you know are fictional, but you know it's. It, shit in, shit out. <laughs> I mean, that's all there is. To, it's a, just the easiest way to understand it. You know, you, you got to be careful of what you allow in, uh, because that's what's going to come out. And when it comes out, you, 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 don't, people collectively don't understand. They're literally creating something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some small bit is being created, and you might think, well, it's just me. What can I do? It's no big deal. How much can I affect all this? You, you, yeah. It's just you times seven billion. So, you know, it, that, that's, and that's the key. It, it's the, the run-up, you know, go forth and multiply. Go, because <clears throat> as we get forward and we want to move our plans faster and faster and bigger and bigger, we need more of you in order to do that. We can't do that with X amount. Yes, we can maintain <clears throat> our system once all our plans are done with 500 million of you. But we, but we can't get there with 500 million of you. We need way more than that, so go forth and multiply. So, you know, once you start putting all this in perspective and seeing where, where all these narratives are coming from and where these, <clears throat> specifically the Torah code, which, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, had a little bit of cold or something going on here, maybe. But, uh, uh, you know, all that instilled fear, uh, which they're doing constantly. I mean, <laughs> it's daily. You literally have to stop watching TV and listen to the radio. Uh, so they, this instilled fear, you know, gives way to an archon feeding frenzy, and uh, it's it's delivered by those who you would never expect. But on the contrary, you, you're programmed to trust. So, uh, you know, I touched on the science of the holographic universe theory previously in the, in the book and stuff, so that to help people understand that. But, uh, you know, for the sake of discussion, uh, we, we have to understand that we're, we're, we're living in that reformatted reverse image reality from where it was supposed to be, where it was originally. So, but we also retain the eternal creator's given power of creativity within the soul does the living soul which is who you are the body that you're in is not who you are 
Uh, that's another problem with humanity is, you know, that's why people fear death, because they, they, they perceive their physicality as being all they are. And again, that's, they believe that because it's been uh, an undercurrent of false narrative as well for, you know, God knows how long. So, uh, but we retain that, that power, that creative power within our souls. Uh, and then we have this, the unified soul power, you know, uh, through suggestion, through the fear narratives, which then become reality. And that's why they need more and more of us more than likely to, to get to their, to their end game. Uh, but unfortunately at this point, a lot of people, uh, a large percentage, and it seems to be growing faster and faster, and this whole, well, whatever you think about Donald Trump and, and what he's doing, uh, he has uh, at least reached a lot, another large portion of a sleep generation of people that, uh, that, that I couldn't touch and that you couldn't touch and that many other people who are teaching these types of things to help people wake up could not touch. And, and he's at least doing it in such a way where at the very basic level now they're having to question their reality. They're questioning everything. You know, oh, this is fake. This is fake. This is controlled. This is – the media is all controlled. You know, and once they start – once that starts breaking down, once, once that mainstream narrative in their, in their paradigm starts breaking down, then people like me can get to them. Or people like you, and and but but until that happens, so you gotta you know for whatever you think of that guy, um, he he's at least been put forward to, to do that. Whatever he does. Oh no, he's completely him. disruptive to the system. And I've said this. I mean, I'm not involved with the political process because I know what it is, and I know the cost you have to pay in order to participate with that. I'm not willing to do it. But my my what I've said to people is, look, if you've got to do this understand that Trump will be disruptive enough to give us a breathing space here, a break away from the narrative that has been spun through every administration since Reagan. I mean, certainly George Bush won the, you know, the first Clinton dynasty through to Bush two and eight years of Obama. And people look at this and, and they think, well, you know, these are Republicans, they're Democrats, you've got white guys, you've got a black guy. No, it's all the same control grid. Um, Trump stepping into it as an outsider, at least in terms of the political process, while he is certainly not an outsider in terms of the power structure, uh, throws an interesting wrinkle into this that, that I think people need to consider. But I, I think the greater point that I've tried to make to people is why are you giving your power to these people in the first place? You know, what imaginations are you drawing from their narratives related to you specifically and to the wider culture? Because that's what right. people are doing. They still want a God. They still want a king to rule over them. Yes, and that's another thing I put in the book. Yeah. You know, I, as you know, I use that, uh, that, 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 that uh, portion of, uh, of, of, of Prophet Samuel to show people that they're still doing the same thing. And, and, but they don't know. They don't know that. See, they don't know any of this. That's, that's why this information is so important and why I put it together that way in the book, or why I was led to put it together that way in the book, because they, they need to come to the reality that they are more than they think they are and, or know they are. And, and, but that's great, but it's being used against you and, and, and it's being used against everyone. And that, that's the problem, because just like a computer software permits updates, our corporate reality complies as well with being updated in this system mm -hmm. through the false narratives. You know, we accept this updated, you know, virus version to our human software, and we integrate it, and now it becomes an integral part, you know, this creation level, without us even knowing. We don't, most people don't even, they don't even realize this, that this is literally happening in, in real time, although very slowly, thankfully, uh, again, why you need more numbers to move it faster, you know, which is, uh, you know, and then towards, uh, so I would, I would tell people to look at uh, the elite's wish list, and, and, and as you see, what's been on towards the top of the wish list, if not at the top of the wish list, for some time now, 
has been a reduction in population. You know, yeah. so, yeah. you know, why? Why is that at the top of the wish list? Well, because the archons are bringing their, their <clears throat> next phase to fruition. And they know they're not going to need nor be able to control uh, that many souls uh, being in the system uh, physically uh, after the fact. After yeah, no, no, and this is a management problem because the greater numbers are also spinning off larger numbers of people who are waking up. You know, right. That's and, not lost on them at all. Right. No, it's definitely not. And in fact, they know it beforehand. I, that's why I went into it uh, in the book about the 60s and about what people have told me about the 60s. And, and, and I look back at that and I see, oh, I, this was happening in the 60s. And what's funny and what prompted that in the book was because uh, as people read uh, The Land of Me United, the first book years ago, uh, I got all these old, older people older than me coming back, you know, people that lived through the 60s and, and directly were involved with everything going on there. And even more than I knew, I didn't never pay that much attention to the details of the whys and wherefores of the 60s and the movement and everything like that. But they started bringing things to my attention. Uh, like, I, did, I didn't know, you know, uh, what somebody told me that, that you could have been living in California your whole life and been part of that movement as you got a little bit older. You're part of that movement. You're, you're protesting. You're doing this, you're doing that, whatever. And then you take your, uh, you know, VW microbus <laughs> across country, uh, you know, with your 8x10 colored glossies. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, you, you go across country, and you go to Ohio, wherever, and they were telling me that um, the people there knew all the same information, felt all the same way, uh, and, and, and uh, were moving and doing all the same things. And this is before any kind of internet. This and obviously the, the TV news wasn't really uh, nationally making this happen. This 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 connection. So it was a soul connection that was actually happening. I believe the movement that might be happening now, in a greater but more but a quieter, on a quieter in a quieter way, uh, but maybe a, a more spread out way because now it's worldwide, not just the United States. This enlightenment that's happening that has been happening is is what was trying to happen back then that's the correlation i put together in the book it looked like it was but but when you look at all that and you look how the government moved against it in so many ways uh using the cia using uh, fbi especially uh taking out dignitaries and 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 you know that we are all finding out is true now that the fbi was behind quite a bit of that and and things like that well that to me, that correlates. I see that, and I say, all right, so, so I see what's happening. The, the awakening of the souls then, at that time, um, wasn't great enough, and it wasn't fast enough, but, and it surely wasn't quiet at the beginning. So it had no stealth at all. And uh, the Archons saw it immediately. And what they did was step by step. They tried to stay ahead of it uh, in parallel, but stayed ahead of it, and uh, and they definitely stayed ahead of it at that time. This time, in the last five or six years, as I've been noticing it, and five years ago, four, four or five years ago, I, I pretty much everybody was telling me I, I was seeing things that no, there's no enlightenment. I don't, I don't really see that. I see everybody going the other way. They're all stupid. They're all, they're all ignorant. They, they you know, they're all going to go down. They're all going to be in FEMA camps. They're all going to be killed. They're about, about, you know, all this. Hmm. And, oh, the patriot and, fear porn. Yeah, and I was seeing the other. I was seeing something else because I had a different vantage point. I had a different, you know, I had a different perch uh, as teacher, as and, and in this realm of things that I do, uh, I had a different, different, you know, uh, plan view of what was going on, and I saw an emergence. Uh, I saw people waking up. I saw people. I saw the whole. Uh, again, I I, I hate. Uh, kind of referring to this because people think that I'm only referring to a diet and I'm not, but I, I saw all this emergence all of a sudden within the last five years of uh, people going to vegetarianism and veganism and stuff like that and getting away from and all these movements, all these videos with you know, all these great doctors and PhDs on them. Some of them, even my friend, Dr. You know, Dr. McDougall and, and others, that 
or on these shows, and I thought, wow, this is this is really blowing up. And then then you saw that the, the China, uh, uh, the, the China, what is it, the China experiment or the China, um, oh, what's his name, Dr. China syndrome. Yeah, uh, uh, his book that he wrote. Oh, okay. It's a, a giant, the China. <laughs> We're both grappling here for something. But... I'm getting old, and I got still got too much information in my head. So. <laughs> You know, but I saw this starting to emerge and then really pick up speed. And uh, But it was somewhat quiet. It wasn't like the 60s. And I think that's what allowed it to pick up some he- uh, some, some head on that steam, you know, to, to push forward. And, uh, before, and I don't think the Archons, I think they're behind us this time. And I, although I think they could be highly dangerous, I think they're not. They're parallel, but they're they're behind this time. So that's why you're seeing uh, all of these, uh, you know, shootings and the wars, and, and they're trying to start World War II. They're they're insane at this point. They're they're literally gone to the point where they've decided uh, at some level that they have to pull another Noah time of Noah. You know, they have to. Yeah. Um, that, that. Yeah, they have to shut down the epoch. Isn't, but this, you know, in studying, in studying the rises and fallings of civilizations, what you start to see is we go through these periods. Um, one of my guests years ago would call these convergences, these enlightenings, the axial age and, mm-hmm. you know, times of great awakening. And then that would hit a certain level. And then all of a sudden, Something would just come in and come in and strafe the whole thing, and then you would have near extinction level events begin to occur. Civilizations would get wiped out. It seems like the arc of human consciousness reaches a certain level, and then it just gets you know it's snuffed. Right, and 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 uh, I think that's you know that's the final option uh, is is to end the epoch, and. Uh, you know, maybe that maybe that goes. Maybe some of that revelation, that alleged prophecy of revelation. Maybe some of that is true. Maybe maybe it was added to. Maybe yeah, you know, we know. No, I've of- always considered that it's a dual-edged sword because we're dealing with things on a predictive level, and there's two narratives, at least in the Book of Revelation. I right. mean, by and- the time you get to chapter 22, there's another outcome. There's it looks, it looks to me like there's a split. You could call it yep. a split in a timeline, a split in a t- civilization, a split in the worlds itself dividing in some some strange way. So it Lordy. looks like part of it goes through hell, and the other part of it seems to come out on the other side of the thing as this perfected, reborn creation. And, and, and possibly an easier way to look at it, uh, because I like to boil everything down to its minimals, and I haven't read it too many times, but... It might be just, and I have to use, you know, the known history that I have to, to predict the future. So, for me, Revelation in in the in the textual experience is much later. So, than everything I know, because uh, it's it's what you call New Testament. So, uh, if you look at that book, it instead of it being in two parts or three parts, it could be just like everything that's done. Uh, to the Torah and to the historical writings, not so much the prophets, but the, the Torah and the historical writings in what you call the Old Testament. Um, maybe they just stuck a center section in there, like like they did in Exodus. See, Exodus mm-hmm. goes up to about uh, Exodus 18, and then there's this whole section that's stuck in there, and then it, then it picks up again at around 35. Uh, to the more ancient writings. So if you take out that middle section and put them both back together and then uh, take out all the little other parts that they interjected after 30, let's say 30, uh, chapter 30, and on, you take out all those sections that you know are much later additions versus the, the most ancient text of that writing, then you put it all together and you read it and you're like, oh, wow, okay, now it makes sense. It, 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 you know, now it flows. So that is probably what happened in Revelation. There's probably a whole center section that shouldn't be there. And if, and if you can find out where it starts and where it ends and pull it back together, then you'll probably have a more 
normalize. Well, actually, you can do that. You can take the first three chapters of Revelation and carve out all of the trumpets and bowls and other judgments that go on there. And by the time you get to, to Revelation chapter 21, you do have a different narrative. I mean, I've looked at it that way, and I've studied the book for 20 years, so, you know, I'm kind right. of fluid in it. And, and okay. I guess where I'm going with all of this, Schmiel, is it's just it looks like um, there's all of this predictive machinery that is spinning around us. The web bot, obviously, there's something going on with that. And I know what Cliff High has said about it in terms of it basically being a barometer of the emotional temperature of the Internet at any given time on different topics. And right. it seems to be predictive on the level that you can begin to run algorithms against it. But Cliff would be the first person to tell you that it's been rather imperfect. They've missed a lot of predictions because there's an X factor in all of this. And what I think is, even with the archons, again, we keep calling them gods, and I do it too. I do it with a small G in my, my tongue planted in my cheek because we keep assigning to them greater power than they actually have. The X factor right. in all of this is something that's within us that supersedes their ability to totally control this mess. Right, and the X factor is the soul. See, he, he looks at it like, like the way you just explained it, and I've heard him say that, that it's it's taking the temperature of the Internet, of what's being driven on the Internet, but it's not. It's taking the temperature of the projected output of the collective soul consciousness, of the individual soul consciousness and the collective soul consciousness. That's what, it's, that's what they are monitoring. That's why, that's why it, it, it literally proves what, what I'm saying about all this, as far as that goes, is, is that they uh, are able to do that, therefore the reverse must be true. If you're able to track that consciousness, then the consciousness exists. Thus, why is the consciousness being tracked in such a way, uh, uh, or able to be such a track in such a way, if, if nothing is happening to that consciousness, if it's not assimilating uh, particular data, thus driving uh, into the Internet and into other sources, movies, books, etc., um, and, you know, so it, it literally proves what I'm saying and what many other people are saying, that that soul is a creative conscious, is a creative entity. And the X factor, uh, the only thing that he, like you said, he's saying, well, it's, it's not perfect. You know, many times they'll predict something from that, uh, uh, from, from compu the computations or whatever, the collective data of, of the soul consciousness, which just happens to be uh, driven on the Internet more than not. Uh, is but but you're saying you know that they're not always right they're off because this didn't happen or that didn't happen well it didn't happen because there's just not enough souls the impetus of the souls and the amount of souls is not enough to allow these evil entities who are not gods uh they want to be as God, so they're controlling souls. That's how they're as God, by controlling souls, by, by recreating, reformatting this creation. Um, that's how they are as God. Let us make man in our image. Therefore, we're their God. But they only made the physicality in their image. Not, uh, they only made the way we act in their image through their narratives. See, so uh, Cliff High, he, he's he's not wrong. His, his his system, it's not that it's not working. I, I believe it is working. Yes, I do too. Yeah. Right. It, it's just not. It's just that uh, the the fulcrum. You know, there's not enough there, there's not enough weight anymore to to cause said events to actually to be actualized to come into fruition by the evil archons whatever you want to call them that it because there's too many people ignoring it there's too many people starting to go the other way starting to deal in 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 love instead of hate and that's why they're driving that hate narrative through you know blacks against whites and 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 isis or arabs against everyone and 
And without that, they have nothing. If, if, if everybody would just stop and say, not listening to that, uh, not voting for that, uh, not being involved, not going to think about it, I'm done. I'm going to go out for a walk, so I'm going to go hang out in nature. I'm going to go have fun with my friends. I'm going to go do whatever the heck I do that brings me joy, it brings other people joy. I'm not going to be in I'm just not going to walk around being a, a jackass. I'm going to stop being mean to everyone. I'm going to I'm going to take a second and you know, it be part of the solution. You're either part of the problem or part of the solution. There's no in between on this thing. So, and I but think the solution people- is not what's being presented. That's that that's part of the issue. It's like the cliche that somebody said to me. Well, if you don't vote, you don't have the right to complain. And I went. Well, I don't really have anything to complain about because it's not my system. Right. You just I, need to understand what you're voting for and whose power you're giving away. Because, right. yeah, I agree the system's screwed up and I agree that it impacts my life, but it impacts it only to the degree that I have to interface with it. And I just keep reducing that every year more and more. Right. Right. So, so, the, so we have, you know, to, to just to end, I guess, kind of this topic, I guess we move on yeah. to the next one. But I guess the Torah Code, you know, is one of the things that is not, you know, now being used to redirect the soul con, the man's soul consciousness uh, with with an ongoing influx of, like, updated control narratives. And then those narratives, are, the, the, the heinous thing about this is that it's supported by the... They're, they're like religious narratives now that are being supported, uh, you know, in, in reverse. They're, they're, they're being supported by the echoes of, like, previously assimilated fear-based religious narratives. That are, uh, so, and that's giving it authority in a lot of people's minds, you know, especially Christians. They're, the Christians are just all over that, you know, if, if, if the rabbi says it, you know, it's got to be true. <laughs> and, and, you know, so they... And and it's all working with this reverse exit, as usual, with reverse exegesis. Yeah. And circular you know, you, you just put those two together and get a hell of a cocktail. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, but they're, they're, they're touting the proof of their God. And that's what everybody's got to realize. They're touting the proof of their God. And they know who their God is. I go into that in the new book. And I tell you, I, I, I tell you, and I even show you. Uh, through through a, a, a recent near death experience from that uh, Israeli kid, um, which is was last year I believe, and uh, and it just goes it just notches out everything I'm telling you in the book. It, he he his his vision when he, when he went to heaven and saw what he saw and heard what he heard and was told what he was told. <laughs> he might as well just read the, wrote the book for me. I mean it it, it was. It was step by step, exactly what I'm telling you in the book, and and this is, this is all the narratives that are being put together that the WebBot program is doing nothing but reading. So, uh, maybe if there was more people buying into all this, all the fear narratives, I, it it must be happening less and less because I do remember years ago the WebBot program seemed to be spot on a lot maybe five years ago or something, four years ago. Uh, you know, cause I had a friend that was really into it, and he was always sending me, oh, look at this, yeah. this happened. I mean, you know, they predicted this, and this happened damn near 90%, you know. And, yeah, and, of course, it's only happening at percentage. Even if it happens, it's a, a close approximation of, 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 the, of, of what he predicted or what the, the program predicted. Why? Because not only do you not have enough souls and a dwindling amount of souls, uh, who are who are active uh, in their fear narratives, uh, and it's dwindling and dwindling, like we were talking about. Uh, so uh, not only do they not have enough, and it's dwindling, but what they do have is not always so specific. Because why? Because uh, every because like I like I show you in the book, uh, and I call it the Eden. Uh, the Eden effect um, in the book that that not all people, well, almost no one, no soul, no person, takes in and assimilates information, whatever it is, 
the same way. No one sees everything they see in this physicality exactly the same way. Now, the nuances that are, that are different from me to you or you to somebody else, you know, when you're looking at a car or a beautiful woman or whatever, as I, as I go through in the book, I, I use these examples and I show you that, all right, me and this guy, because we're, we're a lot alike, well, you're a lot of, that's why you're friends, because <clears throat> there's more like, there's more things uh, th- about you that are, that are alike than, than not. So that's why you and these three guys and these two girls, well, you're all friends, it's a little click, and that's why that click is a click, because you're all more similar than dissimilar. Therefore, when you all look at this thing, this object, you all see pretty much the same thing. It, it all looks the same. And if it's, a, it, if it's a fear narrative being thrown at the five of you now, for whatever reason, you're, you're all uh, consuming it. You're all, you're all uh, processing that fear narrative, all five of you, about the same way. Right. right? Yeah. But, but the guys that other people you know that you really don't like, you totally don't click with them, they're, they're enemies, whatever you want to call them, those people see the same object or see the same fear narrative being tossed their way. They do not consume it, assimilate it, whatever you want to call it. They don't process it this anywhere near the same way you do. And that goes on from person to person, click to click, whatever. It's, it's, it's pretty widespread. And then, 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 when you, then when you get to different countries, different languages, different cultures, now it, now it really starts. And now you have massive voids between how uh, I uh, process something coming in versus the way, um, you know, a Saudi national will process it, uh, you know, someone from there, so, uh, or someone from, you know, Africa or whatever. So uh, it, it's, that is, I think, the X factor that nobody quite thinks about or gets. Uh, and that's why, yeah, his his system will track something, and it's tracking pretty close, and he's got high numbers and high percentages, and it looks like it's going this way as an event, X, Y, and Z, but it quite doesn't make it to the end of the tracks. Why? Because there wasn't enough. It was diluted. The, the impetus of the souls who were all obviously scared of something that he's tracking. Okay. They're all scared of some assemblance, some, some variation in one way or another of, of a bunch of narratives that came their way or a few specific ones that came their way this week or not last week, whatever, but they're all taking it in and deciding on it and then projecting it out in, in, different ways and that is the x factor and i think that is beautiful it's 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 a great thing because uh we're not the borg and if we were the borg you know if if we were uh, a hive uh mentality this hive connection then forget it this would have been over on day two uh we, we, right, we, we exactly would been, yeah yeah we would have been collectively uh Whatever I don't I don't really know what the end game is other than what uh, ancient text tells us or, or predicts or it might be, but that's what we're I think that's what we're looking at. We, that I think that's the X factor. So um, and and that's why they've gone so far. Like whatever it's the Book of Revelation, if they stuck something in the middle or they went through all our all our books and you know changed this and changed that and 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 they did that on purpose because why? Because that that is the narrative they need to, to, to move forward and to live through time, through generations, so that they can build on it later as technology grows, which they already know is going to grow. But again, they can't just come down here and drop it into our laps and say, wow, look at this. Uh, this is uh, anti-gravity, and this is this, and this is free energy. <laughs> yeah, anti-gravity. Oh. We now have anti-something that apparently doesn't even exist, which... Kind of helps us shift over here on our topical level. We're almost up on the first hour of the show, so um, I think we gave that a real good um, airing, and people can go back and listen to the second episode of this if they need to um, refresh themselves on what was said in that show. 
because the the web bot was a continuation of that 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 first segment we did on episode two, which included the AI, the archons, and um, that segment that we did from Alex Jones. So um, <clears throat> the next place we're we're going to kind of go here, Shamil, we'll kind of now pick up the thread from. The second part of episode two, where we got into, mm, uh, boy, I hate using this term because it's such a tripwire, the flat earth. You're calling it, you're calling it a flat creation space on your website, which is ancient Hebrew learning center dot blogspot dot com. And I kind of like that concept right there a flat creation space because even it is not really flat and in fact what we're actually dealing with here may be closer to this stacked level of of creations that intermingle with each other so pick up anywhere you want you want to with that because we're kind of then going to go into genesis chapter 11 and the tower of babel and how that then connects us to cern well, I, I uh, recently put up something. I, I probably should have sent it to you before I did. I, but we actually, I think it was up before we started even the first show. But I put something up on a blog spot, which I think is the first thing that comes up when you go there. That's my hypothesis of where the flower of life comes from, where yeah. the tree of, where, where the Kabbalah, Kabbalic tree of life uh, design comes from. Um, it's very ancient. Both of those are super ancient. They're found everywhere in every culture. Uh, so I, I think what I did was I, I, I put that paper out there for people to read if they want um, to get an idea of where I'm coming from that. It, it coming from on that. I, I don't teach flat Earth. I never did. Like I said in the last show towards the end when we were jumping topics. <laughs> <laughs> like jumping the shark yeah but that's okay like i said before you know linear narratives are wonderful sometimes but this is stream of consciousness and i don't i, I don't want to dampen that at all right i i get what you said what you're saying but yeah it's um that's up there for people to get into and look at and get a different perspective on what those two things are because i believe that they are they are actually renditions of how creation everywhere is laid out because you know unlike a lot of religions believe this is not the only creation that's pretty ridiculous but it's also not what they believe it is and and i and and for years like i said in the last show i really uh, stayed away from the subject because <clears throat> it's it's too you know it, it's not even i can't even say it's divisive it's not even divisive it's just it's one of those subjects that, as soon as you open your mouth about it, uh, I, I don't, I don't care if you have three PhDs. You know, people are going to be like, oh, "All right, I'm, I'm out of here," and you know, they just they just shut off. Their eyes glass over, and and they're and they're done. And and my and my other work was I felt far too important to to ever mingle the two, um, you know. So, but just in the last year, it just blew up. You know, I never saw, I never, I never saw that coming. I never thought in my life I would see uh, pretty much the number one thing being searched on the internet anymore is, is about that. And I think it's great because I knew for a long time that it was uh, a very important truth that I couldn't talk about. Uh, and, and it really bugged me because it's integral with, what I teach, it's, it's integral to understand that there's a reason. I, I mean, what, why would they go to such great lengths to uh, change the narrative fi only, only 500 years ago? I mean, you know, at a time when they couldn't even prove any of it, uh, in, even in the most remote. In, in fact, even before then and after then, th there's all kinds of scientists and people that have proved the opposite uh, in our natural world, uh, whether they're shooting uh, lines down a, down a river uh, or for a long distance, or whatever the case is, or using math, they, they, they were proving the opposite of, of the sphere. So my, my question was, why? why? Why is it so important to change that, that narrative? And, uh, I, and again, I think it's because it was a lot easier for, uh, it's easy, you know, you got, again, it's not humans doing it. This wasn't, 
you know, n- none of the greats were sitting around 500 years ago thinking, well, you know, we got to we got to do something about this. I mean, uh, too many people believe in in the creator. So we, we need, you know, we need to change that. I, I, I highly doubt that uh, they got their orders from on high uh, somewhere. Uh, someone that wasn't human laid that out somewhere and and the rest of them picked up on it and and ran with it or were put on a course to run with it which is more likely but it's in my estimation it's the narrative was designed to slowly over time pull everyone's understanding everyone's beliefs away without actively saying it away from god without actively trying to, and it, at the same time, within all the religions, also upholding it in one way or another, also upholding that that sphere, uh, the sphere narrative. So, uh, I, I I think it was it was it, it was it was it was pure genius. I mean, it, it is a very subtle way that they did it. It, it worked quite well, uh, you know. And then uh, they got everyone to put. Oh, there's other spheres out there. And, there's other people out there, and there's other, you see, oh, well, Roswell, and, and da 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 Well, we had this one. We found this. We found that. Oh, look at these cave writings. You know, and, yeah, uh, A, they could have been put up there last week, and, uh, you know, well, look at these cave writings. It looks like an alien and, and, and all this. So they did all this stuff to bolster this, 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 this tributary of, of yet another narrative, this, this major one. And I can't find another reason. I, I, you know, and I don't know if you can, but I, I have racked my brain looking for another reason anyone would spend so much time, so much money, uh, driving and uh, building, fabricating, and then driving that narrative. For what reason other than the fact that if I prove to you absolutely, if I walk up to the edge and knock on the glass, the whatever, the crystal, the, uh, the dome with you in Antarctica, you know, mm-hmm. with, a cam- mm-hmm. yeah. with a camera crew. And, you know, and which, of course, we can't because it's been militarized and no one's allowed there. So, but I'm sure that's, you know, for important reasons. And uh, if we did that, I mean, other than that, how, how else do I absolutely prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this space place is a created platform see because if it's just spheres out there yeah we could all say well you know god made all the spheres and he made all the universes and he made all this and he made all that Uh, hey we don't have that in any writings (laughs) that that's not what the joke says That's, that's not what ancient text says it doesn't lend it to that at all so it didn't come from that so we're, 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 you know, we can all say that, and that's what they do say, but that's just because the assumption changed. The narrative changed, therefore a new assumption had to be applied to it. Well, God made all these round creations, and there's other aliens there, and, you know, the papacy's ready to start uh, baptizing them as soon as they show up, which, which I think is, you know, even if it were true, that's, uh, that's, sort of, that's a major assumption. That why would you have to baptize them? <laughs> yeah, let's, before... bapti- let's baptize God because surely He's not saved yet. Um, <laughs> they're you know, the created us, but they need baptized. I mean, you know, the double speak going. Back I and suspect forth. that a lot of this narrative, as well as everything you just said, was to install cognitive dissonance. It was to throw off. Um, you know, sometimes the perceptions that you have as a child are simple. You know, and I, I thought about this a lot, and I've talked to some of my friends about it. I said, when I was a kid, I used to go on my grandfather's land, um, and there was a hill and a pasture where I could go sit down and lay on my back, looking up at the sky and looking at the expanse around me. It would have never occurred to me in my natural reasoning as a child to think this was a ball earth. And in fact, the longer I've lived with this idea... And, and, and it's a cognitive exercise, because when this flat earth thing came out, I sat down and I looked at it and I had one person that was going, you really need to look at this. And I'm going, mm, boy, I don't know. This is like, but you will find yourself in a state 
where your reality is being challenged. Because when you go back and forth between the two models, all of a sudden your consciousness itself begins to shift. This is what I experienced a couple of years ago when I started to look at it. And it was actually kind of trippy to think about it and go, well, maybe I was right in the beginning because as a child, and I remember this, it would have never occurred to me to think this is a ball. It's like, well, how does this ball work? Because if you put, if you put a ball, take a tennis ball, put it in water, and then spin it. The water isn't inside the ball. The water is on the surface. And the force of spinning it spins all that water off. So you're going, well, how does this work? We're on a planet that's three quarters water. And it's spinning at immense speeds and centrifugal force. Is that what's gluing it together? Am I walking on the outside of the ball? Am I inside the ball? Is there like a... The, when, I, when I walk from Pennsylvania to Florida, am I on a steep incline? Or when I go stand on a mountain... As I've done numerous times, a mountain that sits about 700 feet above me here and, and what, another 600 feet above sea level, I can look out across the river valley here where I live and I can see 50, 60 miles downriver. I can see another mountain range. So yeah, I'm looking right. at the expanse and you, the mathematics breaks down on this when you begin to look at the declination of an arc on, based on the circumference of the earth. It doesn't work. The math fails. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've been out on, you know, just coming from uh, Brooklyn, and, and we, we used to have houses. We had a couple of houses, my brother house, my grandmother house, my parents had a house down in the Jersey Shore. So we would go mm -hmm. down to Jersey Shore. We had boats and everything for right. the winter, uh, for the summer. And, you know, I, I did, how many times have I I've gone out on the ocean, you know, fishing or whatever with my brother or just, you know, cruising uh, in his boat, and he's got, like, a, a bridge on it, you know, the uh, flying bridge. And it's not that high. I mean, it's not going to make the diff all the difference in the world. You're, you're up there 10 feet, whatever. And, and, and you're looking, and you can see the, the base of the Empire State Building from, you know, 80 miles away or 60, whatever we were at that time, 65 miles away. Yeah, well, yeah. if you do the math with the curvature of Earth, the, the top of the Empire State Building should be about 2,000 feet below my, my frame of reference. Yeah, we have Roughly. people seeing Chicago from, from Minnesota. Right. Which, you know, there's, there's many times in people's lives that they're looking at things, proving it to themselves without even thinking about it. The, the natural world does it. And, I mean, I was one of those people that, that thought about it because I read a lot. I mean, since I was a young kid, I was, I was kind of, you know, forced to, at first, forced to... to to read and, and to learn and to make that the focus of my life, not my friends, not my, you know, cool car I got later on and things like that. So it, it was, you know, I had a lot of information faster or, or uh, sooner than most people my age. So, you know, and, and when I, when I would do that thing, when I was uh, flying or whatever I did, it, I had the information. So then I'm looking at this going, wow, how can, how can this be? This, I'm, I'm looking at this and this just can't be because, I mean, I, I could do the math. I could do the dirty math in my head and know that, well, I'm 65 miles away, and then the Earth is 26,000 miles in diameter, allegedly, and that's about this kind of drip. So if I drop, so uh, I'm 65 miles away, it's got to be like at least over a 1,000-foot drop, if not 2,000, which is closer to 2,000 at 65 miles. So how could, I, how could I be seeing this? And like I told you in the last one, when we were talking about the last show, with the, with, the, with the gyros and with the trimming of the plane when you're flying and different things, it's not possible. You know, I, I don't really teach on this. I just tell people, look, I know when I'm flying a plane and I'm landing it, the landing strip, which is supposedly moving 1,000 miles an hour from left to right under me because it's spinning, right? I'll never be able to hit so how am I landing? You know, it's, it's those kind of things where, where you sit back and say, well, it's just physics, and it's just not possible. So something's really wrong here. And then you get the geniuses that say, well, because the, the ball is spinning, then, then all the air around it in, inside, you know, under the troposphere is all spinning at the same rate. <laughs> and it's like, wow, uh, my son at the age of eight could debunk that one. You know, so it's, it's, but people ignore uh, the world around them. So they're not, and let's face it, people don't really learn 
uh, a lot. There's just not a lot of people that you can talk to that that have a lot of, of factual information about weather, about uh, you know magnetism, about <laughs> about anything about centrifugal force, like you're talking about centripetal centripetal force or any any of the forces. Uh, thermodynamics, anything like that. Nobody has, uh, nobody reads about this stuff anymore. Nobody cares uh, because they're too busy looking at their phone. So, uh, oddly enough, because on their phone they can find out all this information, which is, wow, how, how bad does that make everyone? <laughs> so, yeah. I just, that just hit me. You know, so it's, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, nobody looks at the world around them, the, 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 the basics. I mean, think about it. you got 100 foot, uh, uh, you know, just on my property here, I have 120 foot trees, uh, cedars, and, and giant pines. Well, if we were spinning at 1,050 whatever miles an hour, I'm pretty sure that they would all be kind of bent in one direction. Right. After a while, after, after the 200 and something years, these things have been alive. Well, it's gravity, dude. That's what says it's, dude, it's gravity. <laughs> Insert bong gurgling yeah, noise ex- here. Yeah, except for somehow gravity doesn't keep your face from ripping back. No, it's just like nothing holds. And, you know, yeah. honestly, for somebody like me, because I, I'm not a math wizard, a science wizard at all, which was by design by the school system I went through, which threw, changed mathematics and threw me new math at a time when I was in transition. So, you know, I struggle with this. The, a lot of what this is built on are very large numbers. In other words, what it requires to make this whole thing work is distances of millions of miles. I mean, what do they say? Right. The sun may be anywhere from three to 104 million miles. Uh, right, but still, but still leaves a uh, 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 bright um, sunspots on the clouds, and, and it also leaves uh, a, a beautiful reflection that I saw all the time uh, living down at the Jersey Shore, again, yeah. on the ocean. Mm-hmm. As it goes down over the bay or the ocean, it, it leaves that long trail of light, which it could not possibly occur if the light was that far away. No, no, it's really no different. If you take a, a, a real good, you know, 4D four, uh, four cell police type um, you know, mag, mag light. Right, right, right. And you know, would really, you know, trim that beam out really strong and uh, point it at, at something, and then and then go further and further and further away. At some point, the light diffuses to a point where it's not leaving any marks on the ground or on the building side of the building that you're pointing at or anything. It it right. It, light is by definition incoherent. You have to right, go to it, a laser before you have a coherent light beam. Exactly. So it's 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 just it's physics, and and so I don't really have to teach. On the flat Earth, I just have to teach people about physics, about about the natural world. I have to just show them basic things and say, "Well, look at this, look at this, look at this. I can I can prove it's spinning, uh, not spinning." So that's why I used to tell people, "I, I don't really I'm not going to teach you that the flat Earth is flat. I'm going to teach you that <clears throat> the alleged ball Earth is not spinning, and if it's not spinning, then the latter is also, then the former, the, the other is also true. Uh, so it has to be true. So that that's that's how I approach things." I don't, I don't, I don't approach them as trying to uh, teach someone out of their superstition. I try to teach them and show them what they don't know. And and I use absolutes. You know, if you're going to believe that book that you're reading is is uh, the word of God, or whatever, you're going to believe that it's infallible. Which again, I, I'll, I'll stress, no Jews ever believed. That is not something in our culture that we ever believed. That's something that was introduced later after it became Greekized, you know, but that's really a kind of a Greek belief. But and, it doesn't even go further back than I know that's the, the whole Hellenization process. <clears throat> Do we not have the same influence that came into the transmission via Babylon at the captivity or, or because obviously we even have language constructs that the dog leg over into Chaldee and then, um, you know, transitional language groups as well. So we're really dealing with a lot of this material that's being transmitted down through cultures and languages, etymologies change. I mean, one of the things that I've said for a long time is, look at Hebrew. It is read from right to left. Do you not think 
the brain function of reading from right to left is different from reading to left to right? Yeah, it would definitely have to be different. I mean, I, I know uh, ever since I was a kid, uh, it's been more natural to me from right to left. Right. That seems, that seems more natural. It, it, it going from left to right with English, uh, just it just something is almost like a blockage. It, it, it's, it's something there I have to think about. Um, I don't even know what it is. I can't pinpoint it even still till today. So, yeah, I think there is. A, well, it's a, hemispheric activity of the brain. I, I, it's, and I've done this because I'm somewhat ambidextrous. So I actually sometimes will draw or write with my left hand, even though I'm designated as right-handed. I notice that there's a global shift when you move activities like that around the brain hemispheres. And my, my, my point was that in all of this, everything we're talking about, the transmission of knowledge coming across, we're dealing with cultures and idea systems that we don't really now completely wrap our brains around. I mean, Chalde kind of transitioned into Aramaic, which was also coexistent with Greek. So you have all of these different civilizations that are filtering through each other and all of these all of these ideas and transmissions of ideas are being commingled with the cultures in which they were incubated yeah there's no matter what there's diacritic change of all you know languages uh even if they're not uh, uh being influenced by another one like you're saying parallel uh cultures living close proximity uh, that that's also another way it, they, they, they change and morph. But uh, you won't find one truthful or knowledgeable ling- linguistics uh, scholar on this planet that or flat Earth. <laughs> they were so see, we're so used to the same planet, right? But I guess it can still be a planet if it's uh, some other shape. But you just drop the T off. It's a plane. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's uh, but. You won't find anybody that that'll tell you that uh, they can prove <clears throat> this language or the, you know all the language, all the core languages on the planet um, uh, you know were were designed slowly and and uh, formulated and reformulated uh, and and built upon over time. Uh, they They will most generally tell you if they're truthful that all the core languages on this planet just appeared in total, mm. complete. Wow. And that, and from what I can find is that uh, the ancient Aramaic Hebrew, um, also being Hebrew, the one, uh, one son, one tribe, one person that would, would not go along with uh, what was going at Babel. There's a whole story behind that, if you real look at it real close. Um, that that language was preserved. That language wasn't... That was the language that was preserved. All the other ones appeared, in other words. So if you look at... If you look at the... Oh... Uh, we, again, it's, it's not out yet, and, and uh, people are always asking me for it, but it's, it's a massive undertaking of work to do. Yeah. I, I started doing... Uh, the Asher Codex. Yeah, I, I, I started doing my own Torah. Not the Asher Codex, the, the, the Asher Codex. Okay. Book. Um, the, uh, it's the Ben Asher Torah. Okay. okay. So I, I started from Genesis 1, and I'm up to... Uh, I believe 15 right now. Uh, I had to put it down for several years because I was doing the other books, hoping to get back at it soon. Uh, but it's it's a very difficult work to go through it literally word by word and reconfigure the, the, the corrected context uh, because so much was added here and there. Um, not a huge amount. You know, you have different, uh, If you again, if you read the Atlanta Meat and Honey, my first book, you'll see, in uh, one of the last chapters, it's pretty long. I go through it and I show you in the documentary hypothesis how how many uh, portions and pieces from different times were interjected uh, 
it kind of almost like uh, the, uh, the, com- the, 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 well, we know who it was. It was Ezra during the Babylonian period, uh, who was a Levitical uh, priest, and, and also Ezekiel with him, uh, and others. Uh, they're the ones who put that compilation together of the five books. But when they did that, it almost seems, I guess, uh, to put a positive spin on it, it seems that they used everyone's version, like in other words, of these tribes over here had their version of Genesis and Exodus, and then these guys over here, and then the... They syncretized it. Yeah, and they just took portions. So when you go through the documentary hypothesis, you'll see that uh, this section was added from a later period, this section, this section, you know, and they have names for these, and you'll see if you read that book and, and learn that, and it's important to learn, and you'll know. But what I did early on, years and years ago, I... Um, learning and understanding that, uh, you know, this was a later uh, uh, section here from here to here, and this was a later section from here to here, and this was a, uh, you know, a section from uh, a little earlier from here to here. And and what what I did was I started uh, removing all of the later sections, and I would put the earliest texts together. And in nine out of ten times, uh, when you did that on a page or a few pages or whatever, and then reread it, it was you, uh, an aha moment. You, now I get it. You know, you're reading, you're like, oh, why, well, they didn't need this. Why did they put this in there? You know, and why did they put this in there? Because a lot of it's disjointed, and and it. Almost anybody will tell you that. Like you said, you've gone through it a million times, and you're like, I don't believe this. This doesn't, this doesn't even make sense. This story's been told three times in the last ten pages, and it's three different versions, you know, and, and different things like that. Well, that's why it is. So in my – what I've been doing is going through it and bringing your, the, what is the most probable – original context back together because we you know look how old this is and we really don't know how many hands have been in it so there's a lot of information you have to have in your head there's a lot of cultural information linguistic information there's a lot of stuff you have to know and as you're going through it with that information you'll know you you're able to almost feel it i i know that's sounds ridiculous but you're at that level, you're you're almost able to to feel it. So when I when I go through it, and I look at the words, and I know what the words mean, and I know that many times they took a certain word which has three meanings, out of con- <coughs> out of context. They changed the context, and when they gave it to you, when they gave it to into Latin or Greek, whatever, they took the word and they said, okay, instead of this word uh, sheva meaning, uh, you know, seven, uh, or meaning uh, perpetual. Uh, or a long time, we're, we're going to make it mean the number seven. And that'll change the entire context of a huge amount of, of information that comes before it. And, and by doing that, then we can interject our Babylonian, our later Babylonian uh, feast days and uh, feast day ideas and uh, morph them to, to be to, to, into, uh, mix them, intermingle them with uh, some of the older Hebrew ideas. And uh, those are the Jewish holidays that we got and uh, what days they fell on and, and how long uh, they went for and this and that. Uh, did, the, did the Sabbath start at, uh, at, at nighttime or does the Sabbath start in daylight at, at daybreak? See, so uh, in Babylon, their Sabbath started at night on Friday night. But the original Sabbath and even the one they did at the temple – even the one the Levites did at the temple, all the temples, mm-hmm. Solomon's temple, whoever, all those temples, all those first two temples, they still, still, it was not Sabbath until the morning. But for the people outside the temple, they were changed over to the Babylonian Sabbath, which started at night. So, so all of these things... You have to know this. You have to you have to find this, know it, understand it, know how it was implemented, know when it was implemented, to be able to be truthful. And I'm not going to take anything out that or 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 change something back, a word back to its original meaning in that particular context. 
and not be truthful about it. I'm not going to do it because I like the way it reads. I'm going to do it because I absolutely know through culture, through language, through uh, various other other methods that uh, reasonings that that was like this or like that. Because you can also, if you're speaking the Hebrew, if you know it at that depth, <clears throat> you can, you know, like I said in the last one of the last uh, shows, that even in the English in the New Testament, I've read lines and you know. Read, especially from Paul, and reading it, saying to people, this, this guy wasn't Jewish or, or Hebrew at all. He didn't speak this in Hebrew, and this is not constructed in Hebrew. There's no way this sentence was said in Hebrew. I don't care how. No, it was you, Greek. I, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, but if it originated. Very poorly in, rendered Greek, I might add, too, based on what, you know, I've been able to discern the, the structures. I think a lot of that was transmission of text through scribes. I mean, you know, it, it's been said, and I can't prove this, and I don't know if anybody can, that many of the scribes that were transmitting back in the early formation of the Roman church were nearly illiterate. So I don't know if that played into it or if it was deliberate, but it's very skewed. It's very stilted. That, that could be both. It could be both. I, I mean, I've seen, uh, what's his name? Um, Bart Ehrman? Uh Probably where it came from was Bart Ehrman. I believe yeah. probably. I mean, his work's outstanding. I Jesus mean, his was quoted. Um, I read all Ehrman's works. And that was actually that was actually when I went off the off the path completely and went, okay, you know, we have to look at this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So if I read this very short, I mean, if you look at chapter eleven, in in the. In a regular English version, it's, it's quite a bit longer. Yeah, this, by the way, sports fans, is that deaf segue that we're going to execute here at the end to bring you into looking at Genesis chapter 11. So go ahead. Yeah, so uh, if I read this, uh, this is almost completely finished, this particular one, and uh, this particular verses, and <clears throat> I, I think <clears throat> you'll, you'll, you'll see that it, I'll have to make I'll have to give some explanation at the end, but, but because on some of it I'm I'm being very literal and and I'm giving uh, the reason for what the words are and what they mean underneath, uh, in between the chapters, so people can uh, go back and reread it and understand it. But it's important for certain sections to be extremely literal. Um, so if I go to chapter eleven and I'm reading from verse one and and I'll read all the way through verse nine, and where it ends, uh, in in my Torah. Uh, version. So uh, 1, 11, 1 says the whole earth was of one language and common culture, period. It was as they migrated from the front part, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there, period. They said, I had to add that because it's not there, they said, a point each man among his neighbor to put white clay in the fire to burn thoroughly, to be bricks of white clay, to build with tar, which exists bubbling up. They said, let us build a citadel and a pyramid to shake the head of heaven, to advance our progeny, lest we become dispersed upon the face of all the ground, the earth. And the gods descended to see, which would be Elohim in the Hebrew, descended to see the place and the pyramid which the children of men built. And the gods declared, if the people are united, <clears throat> all together united, and this piercing, remember that word, this piercing, which is very specific in Hebrew, committed at this time, and this piercing committed at this time, not everything will be inaccessible with that plan fulfilled. Come, let us descend there and mix their languages that no intelligent hearing of a man to a companion remains. So the gods dispersed them from there upon the face of all the earth, and they failed to build the pyramid, period. On there, the memorial is called out. Confusion, because the gods there mixed the languages of the earth, and from that time 
did the gods disperse them around the face of all the land? End. So what I find interesting, and what everyone should find interesting, is first, how did they know they were going to be dispersed upon the face of the land? See, they, in, in, in verse 4, they're saying, they said, let us build a citadel, a pyramid, to shake the head of heaven, to shake the head of heaven, to break, to pierce through the head of heaven. We know that is what that means because in the verse 6, the gods are saying, you know, if this piercing is committed, is allowed to continue to happen, then the poop's going to hit the fan because nothing outside of this place will be inaccessible to them. I find that all very strange, and there could be very many reasons for why we're here and why they don't want us to leave. But it's important to where we're going with this on the show because what we should be asking, is, you know, in this is how did they know? How how did they know that there was a plan? There was so what we're seeing here is let's disperse them on the face of the earth, and but, but long before the gods actually do that, the Elohim actually do that. These fallen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the people, the the tribe, the the one single cultural tribe that was here, uh, knew it. They knew that was going to happen. They were building a weapon, all right? So the citadel is the citadel, but their pyramid, all right, which is specific there as well, to shake the head of heaven is without doubt a weapon uh, or a device. It doesn't have to be a weapon. I mean, obviously it could be used as a weapon, I guess, but more along the lines of a device. Uh, which is why I connect this going forward, and and it's saying the next line to advance our progeny. What? What? How many people could have been on on the Pangea that was here? Uh, you got to remember at this time, if you go earlier into Genesis, you'll see that that the Earth was just breaking apart. The land masses were just allegedly breaking apart at that time. If that's what it says, so. Uh, but they were still able to go to the front part and the back part, right? So that's what that means. The front part is, you know, west, and the, you know, and that, it, there's no cardinal, uh, uh, there's, there's no cardinal points, uh, compass points, uh, in the ancient languages. So they said the front part or the the rear part, like that, and uh, that's what that means. But they're saying that they need to shake the head of heaven to advance their progeny, which. That makes no sense in the context because there wasn't enough people on the planet at that time, uh, evidently. I wouldn't imagine that that took up all the room there was, that they couldn't break off and go advance their progenies on some other portion of the land. Uh, so, again, that you have to look at that and say, well, wh- how, what, what is that talking about? What, what, shaking the head of heaven and then advancing their progeny, lest they be dispersed on the face of all the earth now – there's another way you can look at that um, as well that's going to go forward into what we're talking about, Randy. And that is, like, if you look at where it's saying, lest we become dispersed on the face of all the earth, that does not have to mean that they were worried about their progeny or them themselves or how many there were uh, somehow being forced into FEMA camps on the other side of the, the landmass. <laughs> okay, that, right, that's... Right. that's Probably not what they were. Th- this is talking about. There's a lot of information missing, but you're looking at people who had way higher technology than we think they had. Had they get it? Absolutely. Know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and and they're going to shake the head of heaven, which we'll go into later of how we're still trying to shake that same head of heaven, and to advance their progeny. Exactly what NASA is about: advancing our progeny. And lest we become dispersed on the first of the, on the face of the earth, which means to me, when I look at the whole thing in, in in a more literal context, is that these are people who believe something was coming. They believe something from the archons, whatever the Elohim was going to happen to them. They they they. In other words, they believed they were about to return to the dust. See, because. Uh, when you look at the Hebrew word for earth, Eretz, uh, it technically means hard, you know, dry ground. That's what it means. Dust to dust, ground to ground. So, lest we become dispersed upon the face of the ground. 
And where did you where did your physical body come from? The elements of the ground. So again, proven by modern science. <clears throat> so I think that's what they were they were doing. They were they were defending themselves. They were trying to get out, get away before the end of their epoch, which they obviously thought was coming. That's when you look at this more mechanically, that's that's what this appears to be telling you, not what the English version is telling you, not even close, you know, and uh, so, and we, and then we see that uh, a very important part of this, like I said, and the gods declared, if the people are on, are united, altogether united, and this piercing is committed at this time, not everything will be inaccessible for them. In other words, we're not going to be able to keep a lid on them, but they're, they're going to be gone. And, that, and this piercing, so the piercing is is obviously, in this context, speaking directly to whatever they were using to, to quote-unquote, shake the head of heaven. And so the long and short of this entire idea here, here is, is that uh, they were trying to get out. You know, they were, they were literally trying to get out, get out from under where they knew they were. And which, again, what does that tell you? That tells you that our souls, because who were those people back then? See, we all look at this like these were different people, different souls. Mm, now, yeah. See, we don't know how many souls there are. We don't know how many souls were here, how many light body beings, living souls were here in this creation when everything was fine and dandy. We don't know how many. I mean, if living souls... Uh, in light bodies don't need anything from their surroundings to continue to live. They don't need houses. They don't need heat. They don't need cool. They don't need food. They don't need to kill. They don't need to do anything. You know, it, 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 so what, what's going on here? There, there, if, if that's what it was, then why, you know, they all, all these, that means these people back then, the living souls that were in those bodies at, during that time, so long ago, at, the, at that, you know, time of, of Babel, uh, they retained their memory, or at least a large portion of their memories, somehow. They knew they were in the fishbowl, or the snow globe. Yeah, the snow globe. They knew they were in the snow globe. And that's the problem with memory. And as you know from my new book, I use the fact that we have no memory of our past lives for a very specific reason. And because once an animal knows it's caged, then it literally lives the rest of its life looking for a way out of that cage. It's, it's you know, a sole mission is to get out of that cage. Yep, I've seen but, this. If you if you place a dog in a pen, that dog is penetrating for any weakness it can find. Right, and that's because he knows he's in a pen. Because you know somehow you know he knows he's locked in. So if you're living on a sphere, and there's no dome, and you're not really locked in, and we have space programs far and wide. And the space programs are telling us someday we're going to be going to here, and then we, and what do we do? We we just bolstered a hall of hell and gone that narrative, uh, out of Hollywood and books. I mean, you know, from Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, you name it. Our whole lives, we, we've yeah. been, we've been I, salted I, with this since the dawn of the 20th century. But since the 1930s, if you just go back and you look at Buck Rogers, I mean, the era of my father. Right. They were already putting this narrative then into fiction, building up to Kennedy's announcement that we were going to go to the moon. Right. Why? Because they needed more people. They needed more physical souls on in this place. Problem is, physical souls need food, need water, and, and they, they use everything. The wood, the ground, everything. We use everything here. Okay, so... You just made a distinction here, and it's creeping into my thought 
So I'm going to draw it out a little bit at the expense of maybe interrupting the narrative. You're saying physical souls. Are you making a distinction here between the original creation souls, divine spirits, living souls, and something else as part of a secondary creation? Well, there's a distinction because the, the living soul outside of this physicality is what I think it is, a plasma-based energy uh, that, mm -hmm. yeah, it might look like it has two arms, two legs, and a head, and, and whatnot. It probably looks like anything it wants, actually. And, and uh, it needs no sustenance of any kind. Uh, but in a physical body, when that soul, that same soul, is locked inside a physical body to animate the body, used to animate the body, as we said before, that science has proven that all the, soul, the cells of our body uh, emit light. Well, how could they emit light if there wasn't something energizing them? It's the soul that's energizing it. We know that without the soul, the body dies. The body needs the soul to animate. The soul has to come down into, at some point, at some early point, almost immediate point, in, into a woman's uterus when she's pregnant in order to take all that DNA, which is nothing. DNA is nothing. It's nothing except for information. It's code. It's well, my computer right now sitting on the table has all kinds of code in it, right? It's not plugged into the wall. Right, right, exactly. About, with it's Windows, set. about 1.5 million lines of code there. Okay, well, it's all sitting in there, 1.5 yep. million lines of code, plus all that other bullshit I have in there, and it's dead. <laughs> Better than a doornail because, why? It has no soul coming in from the, the, the socket in my wall. And so, yeah, if there's a distinction. You have living souls on a creation space, one of many quadzillions of who knows, create different creation spaces that we were able at one time probably to visit or would have been able to, and, and, and seems to be what the prophets say we'll be able to do later, but at, at this time and at the time of battle, they, they knew it, though. We didn't know it. See, they had someone knew it. Maybe just one of them. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe Nimrod knew it. Maybe he got some inside information, like Trump. Oh, isn't that funny? <laughs> you just, wow, okay. Maybe he got some inside information, yeah. like Trump, and, and, and sidled up with all of them, making happy faces and glad-handed, and then said, oh, man, someday I am going to shove it right up that hot poker, and you are not going to like it. You know? And then, boom, comes out, and <clears throat> Nimrod comes out one day and says, hey, uh... Uh, I got something to tell you guys. And maybe that's how it happened. Maybe just one person knew it back then. Maybe he was entrusted with it and didn't like it. Of course he wouldn't like it because you have an ego. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there going, <laughs> I'm Nimrod. I'm Trump. I'm this. I'm that. And you know what you're not going to do? You're not going to keep me here. I mean, I mean, think of it on a, on a lower level, on a more subtle level. <clears throat> Many people, most people, what's the one thing that you cannot do to most humans if you really don't want them to go do something, especially children? Tell them they can't do it. Right. Exactly. So the reason why that's in there innately in humans is because it's in the soul. It, it, it's, it, inherently, it knows it's trapped. Cognitively... It's not getting through anymore for a long, long time. Because if it did get through to most of us, yeehaw. We, you know what would happen? We would, there would be gnashing of teeth. That's what would happen. And renting of clothes. Exactly like the prophet said. Because what will happen is everybody will see it. They'll walk up to the side. They'll knock on the glass and go, oh, man, I was so freaking wrong. Well, what do I got to do now? And then... They're going to come to the realization in their soul because it's going to be broken open. And they're going to fall down on their face, and they're going to ask for forgiveness. And, and, and really ask for, for forgiveness because so far, everyone asking for forgiveness of something they're not even cognitive of, they don't even know about, it's not helping, obviously. So, you know, 
so it, it's it's kind of the reverse of what that astronaut on on I saw on a, on a show. I don't know if I sent it to you. Somebody sent it to me. It was uh, Rob Skiba, who I don't particularly like. Cause it's, yeah, I'm familiar with Rob Skiba. Yeah, he's yeah, and, he's a mainstream but, 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 Christian, far, but yeah. But they he did some flat Earth thing, which was really good. He and, did. He's and very he did, good at this. Yeah, at this he's very good, and he went through it, and he had some uh, NASA scientist from the '70s, art astronaut from the '70s, and. Uh, Apollo program and everything. He was talking to him, and uh, somebody was interviewing him. And he was saying, "Well, uh, but how did you guys get through the Van Allen belt? Because from what everything we know, you know, you couldn't get through that. It can't be. You can't pass through it. Blah blah blah. You know, you can't get through the dome. Well, not so, only that, but you've got a thermosphere up there that defies um, the solidity of most materials we can create down here, including you know, high density alloys. Right. So it's it's like a, it's like a, a a tiered system. And uh, so the guy turns around and says, I mean, this is an astronaut. He turns around and he says, well, you know, if we went through it, we didn't know it. And, uh, you know, we went through it. Everything was fine. We went through it, came back, and there was no effect, so we didn't know. And, uh, you know, so Rob Skeever, exactly what I was thinking the second the guy said it, Rob Skeever turns around and says, yeah, there there you go. Uh, If you don't know it's there, it won't hurt you. (laughs) You know? So... It's it's kind of the same thing with this. Is is people once they know it's there, uh, they will break down, and it will be the end of this. You know, because he will hear their voice, and it'll and and what will happen? Just like the prophets say, the sky, the dome, will roll back, like like a scroll. There you go, and all the stars of heaven will fall. Well, those aren't stars. They're what everybody thinks are angelic beings. They're souls. Souls that, like I show you in, in, the, in, in the Soul Revolution book, in the beginning in the, in the Genesis and the Hebrew, some were distinguished between and separated out above, who were obedient souls, who were obviously here, and a bunch who were disobedient, who decided to go with the other voice to another mountain and get another law. So that's why we're here. And that's the realization everybody has to come to. Uh, not all this metaphysical BS. It's just a very simple thing. That's what I, like I said in the other ones, if what I always teach people, if it's difficult to learn or if you need a special priest to learn it or a special priest to apply it for you as an intermediary of any kind, or if it's a dark hidden secret and only they can know and you can't know, that that is the red flag of falsity. That means it's all fake. But if it's easy to know, simple to understand, and it resonates with your soul immediately when you come to know it, that's the truth. Because your soul will know the truth when it hears the truth. But there's so little of it anymore, which is obviously the plan. <laughs> to, to create as much false narratives as possible to completely inundate any kind of truth whatsoever. So uh, what we have really in the end is here is what I guess I was getting at uh, <clears throat> was w- with with uh, showing people what it more accurately says about the Tower of Babylon and what was going on there at that time is they were trying to get out. Because why? Because they knew. They were in. Now, was it right for them to try to get out? I'm not sure. I, I, I got to say, it, it sounds double-minded of me. But it's not. It's just because I'm smart enough not to leave anything off the table. Even if I'm not, you know, 85% the other way, I'm still going to keep. I'm not going to throw that other percentage out and never see it again and leave myself with only 85%. I'm going to keep the 100%. Believe the 85% for the most part until until that percentage starts dwindling back that the other side looks more probable. But as far as these Elohim, these gods, whatever that, you know, all the evidence, more, 85 if not more percent of the evidence that I have from everything like I put in this book and my other books, but really laid it out in Soul Revolution, uh, tends towards showing me that these Elohim, these particular individuals, <coughs> souls, are not good. They're not good, and they're not keeping us here for our own good. Okay, because 
there have been people, Mormons and others, that have said that. They have said that. They have said that we are actually the fallen ones and that we broke away and that now we're stuck here. And then until we decide to, you know, use all those words, uh, repent and, you know, whatever, uh, return, as in the Hebrew, teshuva, to, to return, uh, to go back, and there's a certain way to do that, which is why I lined out my first book. It, until we do that uh, on an individual basis and, then cl- and you know, uh, collectively would be better, uh, then, then that dome won't be released and that those guys are just jailers. That's how a lot of people believe it. Now, that's a real simplistic way to believe it, and there might be some truth to that, but it's more it's more realistic to look at that just because you were duped and consented to it, to an evil, um, yeah, you should have known better. Maybe. Again, I can't remember. So I can't remember what I knew back then or what you might have known back then or what we should have known back then. So I can't even say that really. You know, I I just say it because I'm putting it out there. But we probably should have known better. But obviously we were duped, and that's what everything shows, that we were duped. And and, uh, we we consented to it. We said, "Ah, let's try it. I mean, how bad could it be? Right? And, And a bunch of us said, no, 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 no. Not doing that. And then the separation came. What does that mean? Water's above, water's below, right? I go through that in the book. And and uh, there you go. And so some of us are here. Now, who else is here? Well, there you have your watchers, whatever you want to call them, those other ones who duped you. That's who's locked here. I mean, yes, we're locked here too. And those are the principalities of the air that the Christians talk about. And those are the guys, what we're calling archons. And they're, they're, they're reformatting this place, and they want to be as God, and they're going to control us. And they're going to show God that, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter what you say or what you throw down here, and you can send your original Torah down here every 500 years or whatever, uh, 2,000 years. It doesn't matter. These souls are with us. And they're always going to be with us. See? They're always going to keep making the wrong decision. He, and you can say, well, it's because we're getting all these false narratives, and these guys are driving us like cattle. Uh, that is true. That is true. But as we see, a lot of people are coming around. A lot of a lot of souls are being enlightened. So it is possible. What one man could do, any man could do, right? So uh, one soul could do, any soul could do. But they just have to be somehow tickled uh, into it, so somehow prodded. I don't know what does that. I'm not sure what does that. But I, I know I've done that. With, with people through my books. I know the, it, the book has been the impetus for, for all, all, many souls worldwide now to, to just go, wow. You know, I mean, if you saw how many emails and phone calls I've gotten through the years of people just saying, wow, and they all say the same thing. Uh, I've never seen this before. I've never seen it presented like this before. I didn't know all this was hidden. I've, I've tried to debunk it. I mean, I've, I've, I've had a lot of smart people try to debunk this stuff, you know, because I tell them to. I, you don't take my word for it. You know, I'm giving you all this information. It's, it's enough for you to go out and find out more. And when they go find out more, they come back and say, wow, uh, you didn't even put half of, of what's out there in your book. Well, of course not, because it'd be a novel. I mean, at that point, I mean, you know, it's too much for people to read. Uh, so I have to be uh, very concise and very uh, put put in very important points uh, that can that can lead them. But they all come back with the same thing. They all keep saying, "I knew it was like this. I knew in my heart. I knew inside me that that this is what it was." But I didn't have the information. I didn't have the scholarship. I didn't have the language. I didn't have you know all the things I needed to put it together, like like you presented it. Now I have it. Now I got it. Yeah, now it hit. As soon as I saw it, I knew it was true. And see, and and that's and I have heard that so many times, I can't even put a number on it. And well, well, that was where I what I said to you when we initially started to talk. You came in with the information that confirmed the things that I was seeing at the end of my threshing floor series. When I went, first off, this whole Eden thing, this narrative. This is something else. And I got close to it. 
Then I went, oh, man, there's way too many gods in this Old Testament. These all can't be capital G, capital O, capital D. There's a bunch of deities here, and look at them. They want sacrifice. They want animal sacrifice. You got, you know, burning babies to Baal and and all of the— um, all of the things that were going on in that book just went, I got to stand back from this and think because this is not what I thought it was. And then it's, it's taken, you know, five, six years to get to the place where I could come back to this now with some clarity because of what you brought in with Soul Revolution. Because in the process of that, I went through all this other stuff, the near-death experience material. Um, the UFO material, the, the the black science, what was going on with NASA, even this flat earth stuff, you know, now we're at a place where we're pulling threads together in a meaningful way. And, and, and I think you kind of, you know, I think the narrative that we did today gives people a good footing to now see some meaning in what we're talking about here, where this is going. Yeah, yeah, because it's, you know, where, how I, like I was saying, how I see it from, from Babel is that they knew somehow, and they tried to get out. They tried to do whatever they could to get out collectively. There was the first time probably humanity pulled together to, to break out, <laughs> you know, break out of Alcatraz. And, 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 that, and that, you know, that gives me a good starting point to understand why these archons, why these entities uh, really tightened up on their on their protocols and on on the whole memory wiping uh, or or memory firewalling, which I contend is built into the DNA of this physicality. So they made it uh, <clears throat> a lot better. Uh, still, you have thousands every year. Uh, remembering who they were last time, but generally only children, like we're going to in the book and stuff. So nothing on that level anymore, nothing actually probably allowed. It's probably allowed to that level, uh, to that extent, and only to that extent, because why? It drives yet another narrative that they can uh, manipulate just a little bit to the left uh, to work to their advantage again. So that's why people are remembering anything, because I'm sure they have full control over this. And that's also why I think they want their better bodies and our consciousness, our soul, to be downloaded into something else, because it's all about control. It's all about full control <clears throat> and to be as God. Because if I control X amount, and again, we don't know, is it 7 billion, is it 8 billion, is it 100 trillion souls that were here? Who knows? Um, so if you are controlling X amount of portions of souls, which are direct descendants, direct offshoots from the macro soul of the creator himself or herself, okay, then, you know, by default, I, I guess you, if you were, you know, a narcissistic sociopath, you could sit there and think, well, I am as God because I'm controlling God by controlling you. You know, so I, I mean, I guess if you're completely insane, you could you can get to that point. Uh, but what I think we're looking at today is an extension of that. When you look at the round Earth, uh, when you look at everything that comes with it, when you look at the space program and all the new space programs that came from that, and all the different countries, and all the narratives, and all their logos have the same elements. Why? Because it's the same entity. And wh why <laughs> is all the narrative the same? The narrative is what. It's about getting out of here. It's about getting out and advancing our progeny. Why? Because they think they know something. They they want to get out before they be before they return to the dust, before their souls, their evil souls, are ripped out of them. And I don't know what's going to happen to them, but it probably isn't going to be good. Um, it. That's what you're seeing, I think. So, so when we come to things like HARP and CERN, like we were talking about, right? Um, HARP using uh, again, I heard a scientist uh, from, I think it was from NASA, uh, talk about HARP, saying that um, we're using frequencies now, with different frequencies, and generating different frequencies to try to break through the Van Allen belt, and they call it the Van, Al Van Allen radiation belt, only because that's what your little heads can wrap around. It's not radiation at all. 
it's not even something that they can disperse. So, and we know this because, like we were talking about earlier, what was it, uh, Operation Fishbowl, right? So people can look up Operation Fishbowl. We have from the 50s and the 60s, you have the Russians and the Americans shooting nukes, or not maybe not nukes, but high explosives, because nukes aren't real, that they are blowing these explosives up way up in the atmosphere, and they admit that they were trying to break through or disperse a portion of the Van Allen belt, which is, again, not radiation and not a belt. So... <laughs> They're trying to break through. That was Operation Fishbowl. And then after that, we have other attempts uh, in other ways. And then what do we have? Then we have HARP, uh, which is frequency. So they're admitting now that they've been using frequency to try to break through because they think that it – see, now, what does frequency have to do with radiation? Uh, I, I really do not believe on a scientific level that you can use frequency to break through something that's just a radioactive layer. I mean, I might be wrong. I don't know too much about that, but it doesn't seem realistic to me. Um, so, but he did admit that that's what they're they're using. I'm connecting that with HARP uh, myself because that's the only giant frequency generating device I know of that they shoot up at that, you know. And they say it's for different reasons to heat up this and that, blah blah blah. But the Chinese have even bigger ones, and other countries now have them. Why? because they're probably going to triangulate it and, and really hit it uh, from, or have been. And obviously it's not working. And then, we'll be, then, we'll, then what do we have next? We have CERN. And, I mean, geez, do we really have to get into CERN? I mean, anybody can get on, on and, and find out what they – you even have people from CERN who used to work at CERN telling you that, what it's about. You know, and, and, and it I has think nothing. that little statue of Shiva that they have on the grounds there – it CERN yeah. tells you as much as you need to know about CERN. That is not a good thing. Behold, behold, I have become Shiva, bringer of death. Yeah, destroyer of <laughs> worlds. Destroyer of worlds. That's it. Hey, come on, man. I, I, you know, you got Shiva coming through a portal. Yeah. That, it, yeah, yeah, Shiva coming through a Stargate. That, that should tell you all you need to know, right? But, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, they're, they're, they're still from, from Babel. Till today, it's the same souls that have retained their knowledge. They have somehow retained their memory. I don't know how, uh, but they obviously have. Because if they didn't, they wouldn't have been trying from then till today to try to get out. No, this is actually... Okay, so this, and I've talked to people about this because this is an area where I've done a lot of research and gotten to talk to people this is the elixir of the gods for the Illuminati on the planet, the Cabal, whatever you want to call them. And uh, mm -hmm. at the higher levels of Freemasonry and the luminous occult thought, this was really the grail, the, 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 the restoration of full memory. And it's what they never talk about. They never tell you why they're doing what they're doing, what the rituals are about. But this really is, in my opinion, after doing extensive research on it, this is the holy grail of what they've been seeking. Is f and and some of them have it. Some of them know. These are the these are the ancient secrets that have never been lost, but we're not given privilege to know. Right, because because uh, all their incantations, or rituals, and ancient knowledge that they're they're hiding and keeping <clears throat> among. <clears throat> excuse me, a certain amount of families, which some would say 200, some say 300. Uh, I find that interesting, like I said before, because it, you have 200 uh, uh, captains of, of the fallen ones, right? So you have 200 of them. Uh, and so that, that's, that's probably them who are stuck here with us as well. So, and, but, but again, in a different phase, in a different, uh, you, you're not, they're not able to go to them, you know, like knock on their door and hang out with them for the afternoon and get some information. They are using these incantations, these other things to get through them to get the knowledge that they need. They're not actually remembering. They're not humans that are being born with full genetic memory of, uh, not generic, but right. genetic, but, but full soul memory. They're, they're not being born with full soul memory of past lives for 10,000, 25,000 years. <clears throat> they're, they're being born into cults that are teaching them how to get to the source to, to retrieve the information to utilize to break through. 
because, I mean, the end result from what – look, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. It, you know, it's, it's, it's an advanced way right now uh, of escape, you know, through the dome. They're trying to get through. And they're trying to get out. Why? Because <clears throat> lest they be <laughs> returned to the dust, <laughs> lest they be scattered around the dry earth again uh, and, you know, dead and then have to come back, rotate through again and uh, relearn the stuff and start over. So so it's no matter what, even for them, <clears throat> I guess to some uh, degree, it's it's a redo every time. So it, it's a, it, it definitely slows things down. Thank you. Yeah, that's a redo without knowledge of the game. Hey, I think this is a good place to leave it for now. Um, I know we can go further and deeper into this, and I'll leave that up to you for the next series. Um, just for listeners out there, you know, I, I don't like to do this, but sometimes I will point out what the entertainment world is telling you. If you haven't seen it, go look at the CBS TV series Under the Dome. I watched the whole series. I sort of binged watched it on Netflix. I got to tell you something. It's a great metaphor for what we've been talking about. If you don't get too entranced by the entertainment aspects, there's a whole lot of things going on in that show that give you a kind of macro cosmic view of the subjects that we've talked about. Uh, anything else you want to bring up as, as we back out of this today, Shamil? Uh, no, I mean, you know, other than just to say that uh, I guess, we're, you know, we're, we're, what this was mainly about was to really show that connection from way back then till, till now that, that they're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a certain place where for a certain reason, and there's others with us that are trying to get out and I think using certain people with the probably all manner of promises um, for whatever, um, you know, that uh, to help them get out. Because obviously, physically, they can't do it, um, these archons. They, they obviously physically can't do it themselves. Uh, and or possibly they're on the outside trying to get in. I mean, that, that's kind of hard to discern who's on the out and who's on the inside, you know, but... I mean, we know we're on the inside, but, but who else is with us? So I, I guess that's what people have to try to wrap their heads around in this one, is, is to understand that it's been happening, and it's been happening for a reason, and they're trying to get out for a reason, uh, which means we're here for a reason, and, and, and that's, that's the main core of this whole thing, is, is to, uh, you know, like Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young said, get back to the garden. There you go. That's it right there. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for Episode 3 of the Tri-Unity Series. Um, all the information will go out on links where you can find the materials, the books, Dr. Asher's website, and uh, we'll, we'll just we'll put this out. There'll be some probably PDFs that have some of the, the, the documentation we've talked about in the show. It's going to wrap it up for this time. I'm Randy Moggins for OffPlanetRadio.com. We'll be back in about two weeks with another section, another segment of the Tri-Unity Series, and we'll see you then. 